and I'm here with tickets for those of you that have signed up. If you don't have your tickets, I'm out in the foyer to catch you, and if you need a map to get to the fair, I also have those. Then the second item I wanted to share with you, if you came in the front door, you saw that there's a box out there by the little um, podium, whatever you call that, and it talks about school backpack project. And for those of you that are members, and you would have received an email, but for those of you that are regular visitors or um, come once in a while and you're going to be here for a little bit, I have some letters for you. Um, the lady, Karen Mobley, is just a, was a regular housewife and mother living out here in Dayton, just the next exit off of Highway 32. And her children were in school and she opened her eyes and saw that there were needs here in Western Howard County, people that are in trouble. And uh, so she has worked with the social workers of the various public schools for years now. And we have partnered with her a number of times, our ACS committee, the Community Services Committee. We have partnered with her on our Thanksgiving and our Christmas projects. And so when she's running a project, we like to support her. And when we run projects, she likes to support us. It's been a great thing. And she does a school backpack project. And there are different things. She's hoping to put together 300, more than 300 backpacks of school supplies for children in elementary, middle school, and high school this year. And so her, next week, if you could bring uh, items that I have on this list, I ha I'll have a letter out in the foyer also today after church that I'd be happy to share with you or if you want to contact me so that you can be prepared and bring something for those backpacks next week, we would appreciate it very much. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Who knows what's happening uh, September, the Sabbath, September 16th? 50th celebration, we're going to be celebrating uh, the 50th celebration of Tridelphia being the God's hands and feet in the community. In the coming weeks, you'll have the opportunity to sign up for various activities for that Sabbath. The program for that day will be different from every Sabbath. More details will, short, will follow shortly, but plan to be here with your friends and ready for a unique Sabbath worship experience. Thank you. Did you say September 16? September 16. That's three days after my birthday, and I thought this whole thing is to celebrate my coming of age. But thank you. <laughs> Gonzalo, you got an announcement? Happy Sabbath. Just a brief uh, um, update about the building committee. Uh, the, pro the, the building permit has been submitted like two or three months ago. It's still in the county and it feels like longer, but it's uh, actually more than three months, but it's making progress, slow, but, um, but it's making some progress. So we got some, some news this week about certain things that we uh, requested and we were a little concerned that it would take more time and uh, because of the entropy in the county, I would say, and, um, but, uh, but it didn't. So that's great, and so um, <clears throat> we were concerned that another permit would be needed for a specific thing, the, the water well over there, but it's okay. So, but let's keep praying because the, the county still is analyzing certain aspects, and, and yeah, we need, you know, we need to keep praying a lot. There are certain things that we are still not, I think we are in the last, uh, hopefully in the last uh, stages of the process, but there are some things that are still a little bit, uh, that need a lot of prayer. So please remember about the, uh, praying for, for the process and for the building, uh, the county officials as well. Thank you. For the rest of the announcements, I would uh, urge you to take a look at your bulletin under the section that says announcements, and you would have some idea of the things that are happening in our, in our church family. Uh, I want to just uh, highlight one of the announcements, and I want to preface that with a story. I, you know, I never come here without a story. So let me preface that final announcement with a story. How many of you wish you were a, a billionaire? Would you ever wish you were a billionaire? No? I see Beth shaking her head. I see, I see Mark here. Yeah, he's saying, 
You know, I never heard the word billionaire until I was, maybe until I came to America. The only time we heard the word billionaire was in connection with the population of the world. We never heard of billionaires, even we had millionaires. But today I am told there are almost 3,000 billionaires around the world. Aristotle Onassis was a Greek shipping tycoon and one of the richest people of his time. When he passed away in 1975, at the age of 69, Time magazine ended his obituary on a rather harsh note. This is what Time magazine said. He left little legacy. No monuments, no great acts of achievement other than a succession of business deals. All that remains is the memory of a tough, self-made millionaire who clearly believed that living well was the best revenge. And though he left a fortune estimated at $500 million, half a billion dollars, time contended that he left no legacy. Commenting on this devastating epitaph, columnist James Shannon would make this statement. To leave no estate is not shameful. To leave no legacy is tragic. To leave no estate is not shameful. To leave no legacy is tragic. Our friend Buzz left no estate. Certainly not in the billions of dollars, uh, uh, Beth. But what a legacy he has bequeathed to us, his family, and those who knew him. A life of faithfulness, integrity, and joy. A memorial service to celebrate his life and legacy is planned for this Monday at a funeral home in Columbia. The details are in your bulletin with a reception to follow in the reception hall down here at 4 o'clock. Is it Monday? I know Monday is a work day, but... If you can, please come out and support the family during this difficult time. His Buzz's wonderful wife, his partner for 61 years, Connie, and his daughter Beth and Rick. And I see Mark. Mark is one of the brothers, right? And you have another brother too? No? Yeah. Ah, okay. So we have family here. Okay, we want to let you know how much, how much Buzz meant to us. And as I said again, he, he did not leave an estate, but he left a legacy. And that legacy will keep on blessing us. For our call to worship today, I'd like to turn to Psalms 1. The first Psalm, verses 1 through 3. If you have your Bibles, you can follow with me. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This is how it reads. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join with scoffers. But they delight in doing everything the Lord wants. Day and night, they think about his law. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season without fail. Their leaves never wither, and in all they do, they prosper. And I think this explains, describes Buzz very well. Buzz did not have much in terms of this world's goods, but he was a billionaire many times over because he was rich in the things that really mattered. Amen. And as we bow down now for prayer, I welcome each of you to join me on your knees if you can as we seek God's blessing upon us today. Loving Father, we gather this morning in the quiet of this sanctuary, shutting out the world and all its activities, and giving this moment exclusively to you, Lord, dedicated just for you, to come to your house of worship with our brothers and sisters. And we come here, Lord, with joys and sorrows. But you're a God who listens to all our pleadings. And Lord, I pray today that you would be with us and bless our time together here 
encourage us in our Christian walk. Be with those who are going through difficult times. We remember Buzz's family. Um, his loss will be felt for a long time. He has left a hole in their lives that will never be filled, but in time, you will give them the strength to carry on. But Lord, we thank you for Buzz's life and for the legacy he has left behind. And may we each endeavor to do the same. Not all of us can leave an estate like Onassis did, but we can always leave a legacy that will bless generations to come. And Lord, I also pray that you would be with Sangeet as he is going to be baptized in a little bit. A lot of people do not know the meaning of his name. His name is very meaningful. In the Sanskrit language, Sangeet means a sing-along. And in many Indian weddings, they have a sing-along where people sing and the union of two families coming together, a time of joy. And today is also a time of joy. As Sangeet is baptized, the heavenly choir is singing as the family on earth is brought together with the family in heaven. And so, Lord, be with us today. Bless Pastor Sam as he breaks the word of life to you, to us. And may we be blessed in our Christian walk. And may we each be faithful to you like, like Buzz was, so that one day when you return, we can hear from you, well done, good and faithful servant. May that be the experience of each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> We're going to sing our opening song, page 341, and let's all stand.
seated. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. This is a high Sabbath. Amen? Amen? Every time someone makes a decision to follow Jesus, it is a high Sabbath. And this morning we have the privilege of seeing Sangeet Kandagli make this important decision to follow Jesus. And I know that there is great joy in his family here. Um, Usha and Solomon and Joanna. And there are other also guests that I see here in the congregation. And maybe if you could just raise your hand to say you're here to support Sangeet in his decision to follow Jesus. Amen. And of course, our church family too. Amen. Can we raise our hand as well saying, praise the Lord for this decision that Sangeet has made um, in wanting to follow Jesus through baptism. Now, this day is special too because thousands of miles away in the country of India. His brother was baptized today. Yes, so I know they are watching uh, via YouTube as well, and I can imagine many, many other church members as well are celebrating um, this important decision that both of them are making on this special day. And we give God glory for that, amen? So what is baptism? By baptism, we confess our faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and testify of our death to sin and of our purpose to walk in the newness of life. Thus, we acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior and become his people and are received as member by his church. Baptism is a symbol of our union with Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, and our reception of the Holy Spirit. It is by immersion in water and is contingent on the affirmation of faith in Jesus and evidence of repentance of sin. It follows instructions in the Holy Scriptures and acceptance of their teachings. I'm going to invite Sangi to come up and to share with us um, why is it that he is making this decision today? Why is it that he wants to be united to Jesus and to his people through baptism? Happy Sabbath, Church members. Happy Sabbath. I'm Sangeet Kandagli, and I've just come here just a couple of months ago, and I live with Auntie Usha and Uncle Solomon. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Samuel, as he had given me the time, and he had taught me a lot of things through Bible. He has sent me to give an example an experience that what I have learned in this, bio, in this baptism session. So, as a couple of months ago when I came here to US and I was living, I really did not think anything about baptism. It was not really in my mind. But one day, my aunt Usha, she asked me, when are you getting baptized? It did struck in my mind but I never really thought about it. I really did not want to get baptized so early. It, for me, it was early. But after some days, I did call my parents, and I wanted to ask them, should I get baptized? Should I take the decision? Well, they said, it is your decision to let God inside your heart or not. Well, after some days, I did join the classes. But in my heart, it was not very clear that should I take the baptism, it was, I, I still had the question that, is this the right decision? But as I, as I was taking these classes and as I was moving on, learning more about God, this question that I had, 
slowly started fading away. And after some time, Pastor, he, he did say, when do you want to get baptized? Is August 5th the date? Do you want to get baptized on August 5th? I did say yes. And I did not know that my brother, who is back in India, also was getting baptized on August 5th. This is my experience that had happened to me. And I want to thank God for it. And just to end, I want to share this verse with you. It's from John verse 50, uh, chapter 15, verse 18. If the Lord hates you, you remember that it hated me first. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world loves you as one of its own if you belong to it. Mm. But you are no longer part of the world. Mm. I choose you to come out of the world Amen. so you do not belong to it. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Sangeet, for sharing this beautiful testimony. And it goes along with what Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 says. What shall we then say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And that is what baptism is about. I'm going to ask Pastor Jim Howard to come up here. I know he didn't expect this, but I'm inviting him to come. He does it in such a nice way. And I would like to ask him to do the vows for Sungate as, as, as he prepares for this very important um, moment of being baptized. And then we're going to vote him into membership. Good morning. Good morning. The day of baptism is an exciting day. And uh, it is important, though, that the church family see the profession of faith from the candidate for baptism. So I am going to ask a few questions. I'm sure Pastor Sam has already asked you these, so you know the right answer, right? <clears throat> okay. I'm going to ask you a few questions, 13 to be exact, that represent the baptismal commitment that you're making today. And uh, these are in form of statement on here, but I'm going to turn them into a question, and hopefully I do that all right. Okay, we'll begin with, do you believe there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons? Yes. Amen. And when I do this, it would be worthwhile for those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists to recommit yourselves to the same beliefs. So I'll turn to you, and you will give me a hearty amen. amen. Thank you. Number two, I accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for my sins and believe that through faith in his shed blood, I am saved from sin and its penalty. Yes. Amen. Congregation? Amen. 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 Number three, I renounce the world and its sinful ways and have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, believing that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven my sins and given me a new heart. Yes. Amen. Congregation? Amen. Number four, I accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, my intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary, and accept his promise of transforming grace and power to live a loving Christ-centered life in my home and before the world. Amen. Congregation. Amen. Amen. Number five, I'm going to go back to question form. Do you believe that the Bible is God's inspired word? the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian, and do you covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study? Yes. Amen. Yes. Congregation, answer carefully. Amen. 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 Revival in the house. Number six. Do you accept the Ten Commandments as a transcript of the character of God and a revelation of His will? And is it your purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ to keep this law, including the Fourth Commandment? which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord and the memorial of creation. Amen. Congregation? Amen. Amen. Number seven. 
Do you look forward to the soon coming of Jesus and the blessed hope when this mortal shall put on immortality? And as you prepare to meet the Lord, will you witness to his loving salvation and by life and word help others to be ready for his glorious appearing? Amen. Congregation, personal witness. There were fewer people who responded. Let me try this again. Let me try it again. Congregation? Amen. Amen. Loving witnesses. Number eight. Do you accept the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts and believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church? Amen. Congregation? Amen. 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 Do you believe in church organization and is it your purpose to support the church by your tithes and offerings and by your personal effort and influence? Yes. Amen. Congregation? Amen. Amen. An uptick in tithe, elder. Number 10, this is a long one, okay? Just wait until I get to the end. Do you believe that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And will you honor God by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful, abstaining from all unclean foods, from the use, manufacture, or sale of alcoholic beverages, the use, manufacture, or sale of tobacco in any of its forms for human consumption, and from the misuse of or trafficking in narcotics or other drugs? Amen. Congregation. Amen. Amen. Do you know and understand the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church? So this is the one that captures anything that might not be captured in the 13 among the 28 fundamental beliefs of the church. Do you purpose by the grace of God to fulfill His will by ordering your life in harmony with these principles? Amen. Congregation. Ordering our lives in harmony with with those principles. Number 12, do you accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion? And do you desire to be so baptized as a public expression of faith in Christ and his forgiveness of your sins? Amen. Can you say amen to that congregation? Amen. Amen. And finally, and lastly, number 13, do you accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that people of every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship, and do you desire to be a member of this local congregation of the World Church? Amen. Congregation, what do you say? Amen. Amen. Pastor, is this enough for me to take a vote? Yes. I wonder if there's anyone, member of Triadelphia here, who might be willing to say, I move the acceptance of Sangreet into the Triadelphia Seventh-day Adventist Church pending his being lowered into the watery grave behind me. I see a first and a second. Now, all in favor, I'd like you to raise your hand and say amen heartily. Amen. 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 Any opposed? Do you hear the silence? That's our warm acceptance of you, and I hope that we'll get a chance to give you a warm hug in the back when the service is over. God bless you, and welcome to the family.
heaven today. Amen? Amen. Sanghi has made a very important decision today. That is to publicly share that he wants to follow Jesus. That he wants to surrender his life to Jesus. By God's grace, give testimony wherever he goes. He is a child of God. Amen? Amen. So today, it is my privilege to have a prayer and to baptize Simon. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for a beautiful opportunity to see your son, Sanghit, bring joy to heaven and bring joy to each one of our hearts as we see him make this decision to surrender his life follow Jesus. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to study with him and watching him go over these lessons. I saw his sincerity of heart, wanting to truly understand your word and truly follow the things that are taught in him. So Father, we ask that you will bless him.
All right. Um, there's joy in heaven as well as here for what we've seen. It's wonderful when a young man gives his life to Jesus. Now, um, the moments of the offerings have come, uh, is come, and today the uh, offerings is for the local church budget, so it's very important. But um, just wanted to share a word about resources. We have to be faithful stewards, faithful resource managers, and, and of course, we know that there are different type of resources, external resources, like dollar sign, bills and uh, coins and things like that, and checks. But there are also internal resources that we have, right? So we are all endowed with a time. We are also endowed with something more specific, which is called attention. We are all have pretty much the same budget of attention that we can allocate differently, right? So we are living again in difficult times. We are uh, called to be faithful uh, Adventists, faithful members of society, and that resource attention is very important. We can do an analysis on how we allocate our attention, our ability to focus and concentrate. But of course, there is something more, which is what are the objects of our attention? Why am I mentioning all this? Because I'm inviting you on the offering moment, but more than that, because I've been studying this week and the desire of age of some wonderful devices that Jesus used to manage attention, which are the parables, his teachings. Ellen White says that he, of course, had these parables to link important bodies of teaching and message to signs in nature, signs in, in, uh, in people's relationships. Our mind tends to wander, but Jesus gave us those wonderful devices that our attention can go to the direct to the, to the right objects. And that's what we need to be faithful ma attention managers in the whole sense of the word and be a blessing and be focused on the topics that the Lord wants us to be focused, right? So we are all equally rich in that resource again, which is attention. Now, I would like to invite the, um, the deacons. Okay, I'm going to pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this high Sabbath. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for, the, for this wonderful opportunity of witnessing this uh, baptism, this wonderful moment. And also, Lord, thank you for everything that you do for us and for the opportunity of returning the tithe and the offerings. Bless this church. Bless all the plans that we have, things going on in this church so that we can be an efficient uh, uh, mechanism for, for the blessing in this neighborhood and in this country. In your name, amen.
And now we, uh, we all know that our church values education a lot, but I wanted to share a short time capsule. You know that a few years ago, there was this dialogue between two people, and, um, and there was this old respected lady and, and a young man, that she, and the lady said, oh, I, how I wish that I could go out in, as I used and stand before the people. I would teach them of the great importance of training their children for God, said the lady. And then the young man, man says, but Sister White, you have taught them, you have counseled them, and they can read it in your books. Yes, I know, she answered. It is written there, but what good will it do if people don't read it? said Ellen White to Arthur Spaulding, and Arthur Spaulding is writing this. And, and so she said, um, sorry, I lost it. Uh, what, what do we do if people don't read it? And she paused and leaned toward this tall man and said, I want to talk with you about the importance of the work to be done for parents. Parents in the church, you are a teacher, you are also a father. Your work as a father is the most important educational work that you can ever do. The work of parents, mom and dad, moms of Israel, dads of Israel, underlies every other, said Sister White. Let the, minister, let the ministers do all they can, let the teachers do all they can, let the physicians they can to enlighten and teach the people of God. But despite all their efforts, the work done by the parents will have the strongest influence on the church. This was in 1913 in Elmshaven. And now I would like to invite the kids to get the offering. Page 218 and sing with when they are written here.
I don't know what size of house you have, but I'm guessing since I don't think anybody here is a multi-billionaire, that probably your kitchen and where you eat at the table was about the total size of the house of Fernando. Fernando lived in Dominican Republic his parents didn't have much money. When the rain would fall, sometimes it would drip down the wall and get on his little bed. But Fernando was a happy little kid. He loved to learn. And every day he would slog through the dust or the mud and he would go to elementary school because he wanted to do something with his life. Well, one of the things that Fernando liked to do a lot, like a lot, is he liked to play baseball. Anybody here like to play baseball? No, yeah. It's a lot of fun. And he said, you know, maybe one day if I can learn to play baseball and I can get really, really, really good at it, I can make money and I can come back here and build Mama a better house because his house was made from cardboard and tin, and a few boards, and things like that. Well, Fernando worked really, really hard at baseball, and really, really hard at school. And you know, he got drafted into a special program to train baseball players, and he had his eye on coming to the United States and playing professional baseball. Well, there is something called the minor leagues, and then there's the major leagues, and you have to work your way up usually. But around the time that Fernando said to himself, I think I'm going to make it at least in the minor leagues, he was so excited. Because you don't make the great big money in the minor leagues, but by comparison to where he had grown up, he was going to make a lot of money at the minor leagues, and he was very excited. But around that time, in his town, a local church decided to have some meetings. Now, up to this point, Fernando really didn't go to church anywhere, and he doesn't know why it was so interesting to him, but he decided to go, and he went, and he learned about Jesus, and now he had a decision to make. At the end of the meeting, Sabbath came after about three weeks of meetings, and he decided he wanted to get baptized, but on Friday afternoon, Fernando got a letter Guess what the letter said? Congratulations. You have been chosen to play in a certain minor league. You come into the office as soon as possible next week and we'll sign you up. Fernando now had a decision to make because he knew that most baseball games involve the weekend and a lot of them on Friday night, some of them on Sabbath, and he didn't know what to do. This was his one chance. He had no money to go to college. He had no way to make a lot of, to, to, to be able to support himself or a wife someday or kids some days or help his mom. He's just, he sat on the edge of his little bed in his little tiny house. And he thought, and he thought, and he thought. After a while, he picked up that letter. He got on the bus. He went to where he needed to to talk to the recruiter, and he said, Sir, this is such a privilege. You have no idea. I have worked my whole life to get to this point. But you'll have to give it to the guy number two, whoever it was that was behind me, because tomorrow I am going to become a Seventh-day Adventist, which means that from sundown Friday until sundown Saturday, I cannot play baseball. And the recruiter said, can't you talk to your pastor and ask him for, I don't know, permission or something? And he said, I don't keep the Sabbath because of my pastor. It's because of what God says. And God is worth more to me than baseball. The recruiter said, you're crazy, man. Where you come from, you'll never even go to college. Fernando said, I know. But God will take care of me somehow. After Fernando got baptized, 
one day he was thinking and praying and reading his Bible, and he felt like God was saying, Fernando, I wish you would study to be a pastor. And he said, God, why are you asking me to go to college? I don't have any money to go to college. I can't even afford the bus to get to the Adventist University. There is no possibility that I can go to school. Well, you ought to talk to the pastor. So he did, and the pastor said, you know, there's a special program. It's called that you can be an un alumno industrial, an industrial student, which means that it takes you a very, very long time to finish college because you have to work very hard for a year first. Then you go to school while you're still working very hard, and then you work for another year, and then you go to school the next year, and it takes a long, long time, but you can work your way through even if you have no money. Seriously, he said. So Fernando checked it out. Pastor took up an offering, and they got him on the bus. He took his one little bag with everything he owned in the one little bag, his Bible and a couple of outfits, and he showed up at the Adventist University, and he said, I want to be an industrial student. What do I have to do? I want to become a pastor. Well, about two and a half years went by, and I happened to be on the campus of the Adventist University where Fernando was studying. I didn't know him, but he was coming down the road. I was just standing there talking to somebody, and I had just said to that other person, this campus is the most empty I have ever seen. What's going on? This is not summer vacation or whatever. And they said, it's Mother's Day on Sunday, and everybody has gone home to spend Mother's Day with their mother. I said, oh. Then I looked down the road, and here came a little donkey pulling a little wagon, piled very, very, a little cart, pulled, piled very hard, high with weeds. And on top of all of this was Fernando, chunk, 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 getting the donkey to go as they came down the road. I said, who's that? He goes, oh, he's an industrial student. So I said, oh, stop him. I want to get a picture. That is a perfect picture, the little donkey, the little cart, and all the weeds. I just love it. And Fernando has worked hard. I want to take a picture. He said, okay. And so he stopped him. And I said, Fernando, can I take a picture of you? And he said, sure. So I did. And I talked to him. I said, Fernando, everybody has gone home to see their mama for, for Mother's Day. Why haven't you gone home? He said, I haven't been home in almost three years, ma'am. I said, why? He said, because I live on the other side of the island, and it's way too expensive to go home. I looked at the guy I was standing next to, that my friend, and I said, what does it cost to go home? He said, about 35 U.S. dollars. I said, oh. Have you asked permission if you can go home? No, I'm an industrial student. I always have to work. But I haven't asked because I don't have any money to go home anyway. Well, why don't you go ask the principal? Is he still here? Yes. Why don't you ask him if you could go home? And he said, but why would I do that? And I said, just because. He said, okay. So he goes over and he comes back and he said, I guess I could. But like I said, I don't have any money to get home. And I handed him equivalent to about $50. And I said, Fernando, go home. See your mama and buy her a Mother's Day present on one of the many times the bus stops. You know, get her something. Fernando burst into tears and gave me a hug. $50 is a lot, but I wasn't going to starve to death if I gave him $50. But he needed to go home and see his mama. Years and years and years go by. I did not know the story about the baseball. But as I... As the years went by and Fernando was getting through school, I would sometimes contact the treasurer and I'd say, what does Fernando need in order to take his final test? Well, he still needs 100 bucks or some other small amount of money, and we would try to help him. And if you will look on that screen there, do you happen to recognize the guy on the right? Do you know who that is? That is, that is my brother. He used to go to church here, yeah? Yeah. And he is the president of Andrews University. And last night, Fernando didn't graduate from college. He didn't graduate from his master's. Fernando graduated with his doctorate from Andrews University. And I said to him, I said, Fernando, have you ever regretted not making the really big bucks and playing baseball? And he said, are you kidding me? I've got the best life I could ever possibly have with Jesus. 
and no amount of money anybody could pay me would make me give up being a pastor and being able to see people's lives change. Fernando today is a pastor in New York conference where he is being able to minister to a church just like our pastor does and is able to help people and see people make decisions for Jesus and see them get baptized because Fernando decided to put Jesus first. You may go back to your seats. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Our Sabbath thought, which you can find right inside your bulletin, comes from Steps to Christ, page 67, if you'd like to follow along. It reads, the change of heart by which we become children of God is in the Bible spoken of as birth. Those who are just converted to Christ are as newborn babes to grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. Or like the good seed sown in the field, they are to grow up and bring forth fruit. 
Isaiah says that they shall be called trees of righteousness, that he might be glorified. So from natural life, illustrations are drawn to help us better to understand the mysterious truths of spiritual life. And our scripture reading is found in Matthew 21, verses 45 and 46. Matthew 21, 45 and 46. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Sangeet, I'm going to invite you to come up one more time. As a church, we are happy this morning, amen? amen? For this beautiful decision that you have made. And we have a gift that we would like to share with you. Some reading material that I know will enhance your study of the Bible as you continue to dig deeper and deeper each day. And we know that God has a plan for him, amen? amen. And we as a church family, we're going to be praying for him, amen? amen. And this is for you. This is your baptismal certificate, very important. At the end, we'll be shaking your hand and um, rejoicing with you for this decision. And we also have a book in the end that we would like each one of you to sign or sign a card that we will have um, to commemorate this very special occasion. So again, welcome to the family, the family of God. Amen? Amen. And we will continue to um, cheer you on as you continue to make um, decisions that will help you grow to be like Jesus. Take a seat. Thank you for children's story, Karen. Beautiful. That was a sermon in itself, amen? amen? Beautiful testimony of what God can do when we make a decision to follow Jesus. And also, the music, very inspiring. Thank you, Joel, for, again, the beautiful gift God has given you. And Lindsay for scripture reading and also the Sabbath thought. Very important as we continue to grow in Jesus and learn what he wants from each one of us. I've entitled today's sermon, A Fruit-Bearing Nation. How many of you like fruit? I can see lots of hands. How many of you like something like this? Mm, I see a few hands, not too many of you. I can see more now. How about something? I'm going to open it up here. As small as this. Yes, what is it? Blueberries, or something. Sorry about that. Like this. Yes, yeah, strawberries. I see a lot of more hands go up. So this summer, for the first time in four years here in Maryland, I had the opportunity of going to a place called Larryland. And to my surprise, there were lots of fruit there. Now let's try to see if you can see it. I saw some blackberries. Mmm, they were delicious. Some peaches and also some raspberries. How many of you liked raspberries? I see a lot of hands going up. I think I have one more picture here. Yes, of peaches. Jesus taught in parables, and many times he used this to give a message to those who maybe at the moment were not ready to hear it. He wanted to share a special message with 
the Pharisees and Sadducees who had gathered one more time to question his authority. And Jesus, knowing their heart, used certain examples to teach them and to teach us the importance of bearing fruit. Have you ever had a tree that after one year of watering it and taking care of it, there was no fruit? Any of you have one of those trees? Yes. Two years went by, no fruit. Three years went by, no fruit. Four years went by and no fruit. It doesn't matter what name this tree has, if it's an avocado tree or a peach tree, but if it doesn't give fruit, it is basically a very disappointing tree. Yes? Yes, it, it doesn't bear it. It doesn't give us anything of which we can delight in. And Jesus, one morning, was returning back to the city of Jerusalem. And Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 and onwards, tell us that he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. The disciples were shocked. They had never seen Jesus do something like that with one word. That tree stopped living. That tree withered away. And when the disciples saw this, they marveled. And they asked the question, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? And Jesus answered them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. Jesus takes this opportunity to share with his disciples and to share with each one of us in order to bear fruit, We need to trust God. Amen? Amen? We need to believe that He is able to do what you and I might think impossible. When I was growing up, my mom had lots of trees. I mean, lots of trees in our backyard. We had peaches, we had fig trees. We had orange, lemon trees. And yes, we had one avocado tree. One avocado tree that would not give avocados. And it didn't matter what I did to that avocado tree. If I watered it, if I put, you know, some fertilizer, it would not give anything. And one day, we had a really severe winter. And that avocado seemed to wither. And to tell you the truth, I was kind of happy. I was like, yes, one less tree I need to water. But what my mom told me to do shocked me. She told me, cut it. Cut it about this much to this, this side, just a little stump where it's green. Everything else, basically the leaves fell off, the limbs were falling off, just cut it all the way down to just that little stump and continue watering it. I thought, oh no, now I have to water this little stump. So days went by, weeks went by, months went by, and the tree started to grow again. I was surprised of all these little branches that were coming back out. And the leaves were starting to form and everything was seemed to just get taller and taller. It was my height. I was like surprised. 
that it came back. Now, about two years had gone by from that moment, and we decided to move away from that home. But my grandparents moved in, and they continued to water that avocado tree. They believed it could give avocados. They trusted that it could give avocados. And to tell you the truth, my grandma, she had a green thumb. Yes, one of those thumbs that makes everything grow. You name it. When she was living in Florida, she had banana trees in the backyard. She had a big avocado tree. I mean, whatever she touched, it grew. She told me that year, that little avocado tree that grew a little more gave a hundred avocados. A hundred avocados. She believed. She trusted. And Jesus telling or speaking to his disciples and speaking to us today tells us the same. If we desire to give fruit, abundant fruit, we need to trust in him. God can move mountains. Sangeet, God can move any obstacle you might face. Trust him. Believe in him. Follow his word. It's real. It works. And Jesus added to this verse, to these words, verse 22 that says, And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. In order to believe, it's important for us to pray. Our faith grows when we speak to God. Amen? Our faith is strengthened when we read God's word. Amen? Amen. Our faith is strengthened when we put everything in the hands of God and we say, God, thy will be done and not mine. And this is the Christian walk. It's not an easy walk. It's hard, difficult at times. But we are invited to believe, to trust God, and to come to Him, to speak to Him as to a friend, and bring any concern that you might be having right at this moment, and say, God, help my faith. Help me believe. I want to bear fruit for your kingdom. Amen? In this section of the Gospel of Matthew, we find several fruit-bearing teachings. The lesson of the withered fig tree. We also find the parable of the two sons and the parable of the wicked vine dressers and the lesson of the rejected stone. And we're going to see how all these teachings that have to do with agriculture, that has to do with um, harvesting, um, share with us what it means to bear fruit. So as we just shared, a non-bearing fruit tree is not fulfilling its purpose and also prevents others from receiving a blessing. Have you ever found a Christian that claims to be a follower of Jesus, but you don't see the fruits of it? It's also disappointing it's also heart-wrenching. And therefore, we are invited, brothers and sisters, to bear fruit, that others might taste the love of God, that others might taste the peace of God, that others might taste the joy of God. We can only bear fruit if we have faith and do not doubt and pray, believing that we will receive Let's go to the next parable that is found here in Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to look at verses 28 and onward, the parable of the two sons. But what do you think? 
A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Jesus asked the question, Which of the two did the will of his father? He was speaking to the Pharisees who had come and said, Jesus, with what authority do you do these things? Especially coming to the temple and disrupting our service. And Jesus asked them the question, which of the two did the will of his father? And they said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Those who go and harvest in the Lord's vineyard are doing the will of the Father. Amen? Amen? And there was a son who said at first, I do not want to do this. And there will be times, Sangeet, where God will call you to do something, and at first, oh, it's going to be like, I don't want to do this for God. But this first son said, no, I'm going to go. Now I'm going to help my father. He's been working hard out in the field, and today, He's asking me to help him, to do something for him. And I know it's kind of inconvenient for me right now because I would rather do this, but I'm going to go and help my father. The other son, many, maybe like some, said, I will go. I will definitely help you, father. But at the end, decided not to go. Actions speak louder than words, don't they, brothers and sisters? And again, many of us may profess to be Christians. But how do we show our Christianity? How do we tell others that we believe in Jesus? Once again, by bearing fruit, by bringing fruit, by showing the things that God is doing in our life and in the life of others. And Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees and letting them know it's not just enough to proclaim that you are a Christian or that you are a son of God or a son of Abraham. But doing the will of the Father, Amen. being obedient to the Father, doing things that the Father asks us that might be inconvenient to us is what brings, again, joy, peace, and love. Amen? Amen. The world is longing to see a group of people that truly believe in God, that trust Him. And I don't know what God is calling you to do, what kind of work He is asking you to do, but what He asks you, do it. Believe in him. Trust in him. And by this, you will bear much fruit. The next parable that Jesus shares with his disciples, as well as with those who were listening to him, is found in verses 33 and onward. Here, another parable, Jesus said, there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, the harvest was near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. 
and the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then the last, then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dresser saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Now let me go back. We find in this parable, once again, a sad story where a landowner had basically given his land for vine dressers to take care of it. And this vine that represents God's people, as also mentioned in the book of Isaiah, um, the landowner made sure it was protected. It put a hedge of rocks around it and wanted it to stay safe from those who would come and want to destroy it. But when time of the harvest came, he sent his servants to receive the fruit of it. And once again, sadly, these vine dressers, instead of rejoicing and being able to share with the landowner the fruits of their labor, the fruits of their work, they decided we need to kill these servants. We need to kill those who come on behalf of the landowner. And lastly, this landowner sent his son. And what caught my attention is that the landowner thought, maybe they will respect the son. Maybe they will see something in the son that no one else has been able to describe. That we can bear fruit, amen? amen. Abundant fruit. Fruit that we can share with others. Fruit that God wants to produce in each one of us. But sadly, the vine dressers also killed the son. Jesus asked them, what will the landowner do with these vine dressers? And the Bible tells us what Jesus shared with them. Therefore, when the owner of the vine yard, vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their season. Jesus then answered to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit of it. Jesus tells these Pharisees, these Sadducees, and I believe he tells us too. That he wants to see a nation that bears fruit. Amen? Amen. He wants to see a nation that, as Galatians chapter 5 tells us, will bear the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Because against such things, there is no law. In other words, you and I are free to produce these fruits abundantly and to share them with each other and to 
give witness of what God is doing in each one of our lives. And Jesus continued on by saying, that those who fall on the rock those who fall on this stone will be broken but on whomever it falls it will grind him to powder in other words in order for us to bear fruit we need to come to Jesus amen yeah. we need to fall on him we need to be humbled as we see what he does in the land of Israel there's some um, places where Jews in the first century would go in to be baptized and this is called a mitbek and they would join they would come in to be purified on that location and it was made out of stones and I believe Jesus was here again inviting his disciples to come and find that source that gives them strength to produce fruit. There are other stones here, and this one in the lower um, left corner on your screen is where olives were pressed. And again, these little olives would be put into a container, and there was a flat rock or a rock that could contain them, and they would be gently pressed so that the oil could be taken out of it and they could produce this fruit. But there are other stones. These were the grinding stones where wheat would be crushed as the stone rolled over it. And basically all the husk was put away. Jesus told the Pharisees, I am that stone. I am that stone that you reject. I am that stone that many others have rejected. But if you trust in me, if you believe in me, if you fall upon me, you will produce abundant fruit. You'll be transformed, changed, and give the fruit of the Spirit. In Steps to Christ, it says the change of heart by which we become children of God in the Bible is in the Bible spoken of as birth. Again, it is compared to the germination of the good seed sown by the husbandman. In like manner, those who are just converted to Christ are as newborn babes to grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. Or like the good seed sown in the field, they are to grow up and bring forth fruit. Isaiah says that they shall be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So from natural life, illustrations are drawn to help us better understand the mysterious truths of spiritual life. Do you want to be a part of a nation that produces fruit? I want to be a part of that nation. And I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, that we can do this when we trust God. We can do this when we obey God. We can do this when we humbly come before God and surrender everything to Him. He will make that tree producing or fruit producing tree. Amen? in each one of our lives. And I believe we have a beautiful opportunity today to ask God to put His Spirit in us and to change us so that we can be a nation that bears fruit. Amen. At this moment, we're going to have our final hymn. And it's hymn number... 569. I'm sorry, it's not 569. Got the wrong one. What is it? 
316. 316. And I invite the congregation to stand as we sing together hymn number 316. 316? 316. 316. Dear Heavenly Father, your people have joined us this morning. Your people are present here today. Because, Father, we recognize that all good things come from above. We recognize that the only way I can change and we can change is if we daily surrender our life to you. And, Father, this morning we're grateful for Sangeet and for his desire to follow you and to show this through baptism. And Father, I know that you want to produce fruit in his life as you would like to also produce fruit in each one of our lives. And my prayer is that your Holy Spirit will be with each one of us and help us to produce those fruits that you want to see, that we might think are impossible to produce, but that you want to do and work through each one of us. And so again, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for the promises found in your word. And above all, we thank you for Jesus, our rock, our salvation, upon which we can fall and find all that we need. For we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
be seated. 